McMaster here at Lovett, and it's a privilege to welcome you to this evening's lecture. Dr. Joan Wall is our seventh speaker in the Civil War and Forging of Character lecture series. This series is made possible by the Ann and Jack Glenn Character Education Fund here at Lovett, and by brothers Austin, Bob, Jack, and Lewis Glenn. Bob Glenn and his daughter, uh, Amanda Glenn Brady, uh, both of them members of our speakers committee are here tonight, back about eight rows back here. Bob and Amanda, thank you for making this possible for us. Great event. We're so grateful to the Glenn family for making possible this uh, terrific series. I want to also thank several of my colleagues, uh, Kimbrough Haverstock, Megan Morris, Sandy Radella, and Kim Blass, who attend to so many of the details connected with this lecture series. Thanks are also due to our speakers committee, which includes Chief Advancement Officer Andy Spencer, Kim Blass, Trustees Hampton Morris and Bob Glenn, Lovett Parent and alum Amanda Glenn Brady, and the Atlanta History Center uh, uh, Senior Military Historian Dr. Gordon Jones. We're blessed to have a wonderful partnership with the Atlanta History Center and especially with Gordon and CEO Sheffield Hale and their wonderful teammates. Are Gordon or uh, Sheffield here tonight? Uh, they may be coming a bit to later. They, they get to most of these things. A reminder that our next uh, lecture in this series will take place at Lovett on Monday, May 19th when Dr. John McCardle, the president at Sewanee University will address us on the degree to which the Civil War represented a clash of definitions over what it means to be a nation. That's sure to be a great talk as, 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 as well. I hope you can join us. It's now my privilege to introduce Professor Joan Wall of UCLA. And you talk about somebody who's all in at UCLA. All of her degrees come from UCLA, and she made clear to our students that this morning that she's a, a die-hard Bruin fan. Her UCLA Bruin basketball team, I think, to the Sweet 16 now. She uh, is pretty excited about that. Um, but at UCLA, Dr. Wall researches, writes, and teaches about 19th century America with a special focus on the Civil War, Reconstruction, and the Gilded Age. She's written or edited uh, numerous books, including Unsentimental Reformer, a, a great piece about the reformer, Josephine Shaw Lowell. Other books include the personal memoirs of U.S. Grant, uh, the history of the Union cause, also the memory of the Civil War in American culture, and also wars within a war, controversy and conflict over the American Civil War. And her most recent book, which I'll speak about in a moment, is on the sale thanks to our, our campus shop. Dr. Wall has been interviewed for many documentaries, including the P PBS series American Experience on Ulysses S. Grant and the History Channel's production of Lee and Grant. She has published a number of op-ed pieces on contemporary controversies regarding the Civil War. She's received many teaching prizes, including UCLA's most prestigious teaching honor, the Distinguished Teaching Award. She won't tell you this, but I've done some research. Her courses on the Civil War are the most popular, the most sought after among undergraduate courses across the entire UCLA campus. This year, 2014, 2015, she has a bit of a dream job for those of us who enjoy uh, academics. Um, She's a distinguished fellow uh, in the 19th century American, in American, in 19th century American history at the Huntington Library in uh, San Marino, California. That means she gets to research and write and study all of the time, and that's a huge gift to her, and she's uh, grateful for that. She feels a strong responsibility to take her research and her work beyond the walls of UCLA. She's been a frequent participant in teaching workshops across the country for elementary, middle school, and high school teachers. She's led Southern California teachers on Civil War battlefield trips and for four summers in a row, led UCLA students on two-week field trips to important Civil War sites like Gettysburg, Harper's Ferry, and Antietam, and Richmond. She's currently working on two books. One is a study of Harvard-educated Union officers, and the other is an examination of the nature of surrender during the Civil War. Surrender changed a lot across the Civil War. Dr. Wall's U.S. Grant, An American Hero, American Myth, the book that's outside in the foyer, published in 2009, has received numerous awards from organizations across the political and regional spectrum. The Civil War Forum of Metropolitan New York presented Dr. Wall 
the 2010 William Henry Seward Award for Excellence in Civil War Biography for this work on Grant, and she's received other uh, notable commendations for this, uh, this great work. I've had the privilege of reading this book. In, in this book, she traces in what I think is a fascinating way how America's opinion of Grant shifted dramatically over time, and she's gonna talk with us some about that, in, uh, that tonight. When Grant died on July 23rd, 1885, after a valiant battle against throat cancer and just as he was finishing his memoirs, his reputation was strong. In fact, many Americans regarded him as highly as they did the likes of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And yet today, the monuments constructed in tribute to him are not visited by many people. Robert E. Lee is considered his superior as a military leader and historians rank him quite poorly as a president, although she'll tell you that uh, that ranking is getting better. What happened to tarnish Grant's reputation and why do we remember him so very differently today from the ways in which Americans uh, of the 1880s felt about him? Dr. Wall will help us understand the many reasons Grant's reputation has changed so much since his death in 1885. She'll also help us more, more fully understand U.S. Grant, a man his close associate, William Tecumseh Sherman, his fellow battlefield commander, allegedly spoke of, again, speaking of Grant, as, quote, a great mystery even to himself, close quote. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joan Wall to love it too. Good evening. Thank you so much for that spectacularly kind introduction, Headmaster Peebles, I will try to live up to it this evening. I want to congratulate you for creating this lecture series and all the people involved and for making American history matter at the Lovett's School and for introducing me to the Lovett experience. I find it extraordinary. I'm impressed to look around tonight and see people here this evening ready to be engaged and challenged by my presentation about Ulysses S. Grant, even though I know that perhaps more than a few of you are, are just saying, tell me something that I don't know. Tell me something that will change my mind. Well, I'm gonna try and do that. Finally, I would like to express my deep appreciation for the hospitality of my hosts, Carter and Hampton Morris, who've been so generous. Tonight, I'm going to talk about U.S. Grant at the Civil War sesquicentennial. I have a, a slide, a PowerPoint slide presentation, and I have selected visuals that will add and enhance to my lecture with the, the point of making vivid to you several things. One is how important and vital U.S. Grant was to the people at the time and how he was commemorated widely, I'm just giving you just the, the smallest sliver of the representations of Grant, good, bad, and ugly. And uh, so that's what I'm going to be doing uh, part as I talk about the lecture. The lecture itself, the presentation itself, is divided into three parts. The first part is an introduction. There may be some people here that don't know about Grant, although uh, Headmaster Peoples introduced him uh, almost as well as I'm going to do, but I'm going to nonetheless forge ahead and, and refresh your memory about Grant. That would be part one. Part two is uh, uh, Grant in American historical memory. How, how have people through the generations looked at Grant? Because Grant was, at, for the time, he was the embodiment of the United States of the Union cause, especially after Lincoln was assassinated. He, he represented something more than he really was to a generation of people, but that changed. And those of you who've heard talks before here or maybe in other venues know that historians are very interested in historical memory, the, the relationship between history and memory, and that's what I'll be doing tonight because every generation reinterprets a, a riveting, important event like the American Civil War was for this country in different ways, in ways that often distort or exaggerate 
uh, the, the nature of the, the conflict or the war or the event, uh, but that advances an agenda of the current generation, the current needs of that generation. And I, that I will be applying to looking at Grant in part two. In part three, I'm going to uh, discuss the revised grant that is coming out of the sesquicentennial, which is actually a process that has been occurring uh, since the 1990s, but is really coming to its full flower now. So let's start with uh, introducing you briefly to General Grant. He was the commanding general of the Union Army and the 18th president of the United States, if you're counting. He turns 192 years old this April 27th, and he looks damn good, don't you say? No, no, no Botox at all. And it would be this April 27th, in the fourth year of the Civil War sesquicentennial, that's the 150th anniversary. Grant, like George Washington and Dwight D. Eisenhower, was both a professional warrior of a defining war and a twice elected president. And like Washington and Eisenhower, he dominated his era, which in his case encompassed the Civil War from about 1862 to Reconstruction, the aftermath of that war. This is a medallion that was struck just, at, uh, just as, I believe it was in 1865, showing the father, the savior, and the defender of the Union. Both North and South looked to George Washington for inspiration, but, and, and both uh, 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 used Washington's legacy to validate their cause, and this was uh, a visible representation of that. But again, it gives you an idea of Grant's stature at this time. One reason why mid-19th century Americans, or many of them, loved Grant was because of his humble background. There's something about it which proved, like Abraham Lincoln's, that ordinary individuals could achieve extraordinary heights. And since this school emphasizes character so much, and you're a part of that community, we can understand and appreciate that today, maybe better than, than many Americans who look at their history. Raised on a Ohio frontier, educated at West Point, there he is, a mere baby, a cadet at West Point. Uh, Grant uh, fought in the Mexican War, like so many Civil War generals did. He became a hardworking farmer who built his family a log house. And yes, he lived in a log house. He wasn't born in a log house, or as they say of Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was born in a log house that he built with his own hands. So Grant didn't do that. Yes, he was a pretty amazing guy. And Grant didn't do that, but he did work in, he experienced poverty, he experienced uh, hard times and, and depression. He was working as a clerk in a leather goods store in Galena, Illinois, when he answered President Lincoln's call for volunteers in that first spring of the American Civil War, 1861. Although fame and fortune had eluded the modest man up to that time, uh, many people have called him a failure because of that. I don't call him a failure because he, he suffered disappointments and some humiliation. I call him a, a person who developed the character out of those experiences to be able to, uh, to display the fortitude he did during, during the war and lead. Uh, um, but few would have predicted that he would become so important. And um, uh, at that time in 1861, Grant, like so many other of his compatriots in the United States, declared proudly for the Union. The 39-year-old Grant did not dwell in obscurity for long, gaining fame in Tennessee and Mississippi with a string of, vic of victories that may be familiar to you at places like Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga. He did not rise to his position from lieutenant colonel to major general without controversy, without, without having to deal with lots of problems, and disappointments and setbacks, because life is al always full of those. In, in, when he did make mistakes, when he did 
fail in some of his endeavors during this period of the Civil War, Grant displayed calmness and confidence throughout the war as throughout his life. He accepted the reality of the situation and moved on. Many of his friends talk about that quality, his, his, his ability to withstand, to keep his head while everyone else around him is running around screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Grant's rare winning record among Union generals secured him a champion in the White House, A. Lincoln. Promoted to Lieutenant General in March of 1864, he took over the strategic direction of the war, achieving victories that guaranteed Lincoln's re-election and the end of the conflict. It was in question as late as, as 1864. The, the Union's hero was praised for his generous terms of surrender, an iconic image before you, at Appomattox Courthouse when he took the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia from General Robert E. Lee on April 9th of 1865. Together, the top general and the president who saw the war through and united their destinies at that time were going to oversee what both knew would be a very difficult aftermath, aftermath of this bitter war. A week after Appomattox, just one week, President Lincoln was assassinated. Shortly afterwards, Grant became the first four-star general in U.S. history, remaining as head of the Army until nominated for president by the Republican Party in 1868. Then Grant, aided by newly enfranchised Southern blacks in states reconstructed by Congress, swept to victory with his famous campaign slogan, let us have peace. And this is a picture of Grant in his, in his suit. You don't see too many pictures of him in non-military outfits, or at least in memory. Once in office, President Grant proved to be a strong supporter of African American civil rights as he was during the war, of eman the war uh, regarding emancipation and the enrollment and use of black soldiers. He proudly signed off on the 15th Amendment to the Constitution in 1870, describing the law enabling black suffrage, quote, as a measure of grander importance than any other one act of the kind from the foundation of our free government to the present day, end of quote. After leaving the presidency, Grant made a triumphal tour of the world from 1877 to 79, hailed by millions across Europe, India, China, and Japan as a military hero and the leader of this fascinating country uh, that, that was clearly going to emerge as a global power. After his trip, he retired to New York City, and the ex-president, who was one of the two worst businessmen in the 19th century, uh, the other one being Mark Twain, lost his entire savings in a financial scandal and was reduced to poverty, a poverty that he hadn't experienced since well before the war. To earn money, he agreed to write about his wartime experiences for Century Magazine's spectacularly successful Battle and Leaders series. Grant's contributions proved so popular that he decided to write full-scale military memoirs just as he was diagnosed with throat cancer, as you heard earlier. And this is one of the, the uh, famous, uh, most famous pictures of Grant uh, at the end of his life, in fact, uh, a few days away from death, putting the finishing touches on his memoirs. And he completed them literally hours before he died. And the publication of this, of his autobiography, which by the way was published by Mark Twain's company, called West, uh, Webster and Company. He was uh, <clears throat> in uh, business to publish books for, uh, with his brother-in-law. And this was the one collaboration, business collaboration that both men had that brought them an astonishing amount of money uh, and made Ulysses S. Grant's family secure after his death. 
for Mark Twain, it didn't turn out as well because with his, he returned to his usual business sense and the next project was a biography of the Pope because if Grant's memoir sold 300,000 copies, it was just a fabulous, best, unex, just really exciting. But, and he thought, well, there are so many Catholics in this country, they're going to want to read a biography of the Pope. No, the company went bankrupt after that, I'm sorry to say. Grant's volumes that are here, this is the first uh, uh, photograph of the first edition of the uh, personal memoirs of U.S. Grant, as I said, sold over 300,000 copies and became a perennial bestseller. They've never gone out of print, something many modern authors would uh, uh, give their eye tooth for to be able to say. Grant's volumes inside delivered a beautifully rendered narrative of the Civil War written from the viewpoint of the man who, after Abraham Lincoln, was most closely identified with bringing about United States victory. Although imbued with the spirit of reconciliation between the sections, this book is, this, uh, his memoirs, the volumes, Grant's account made it clear that it was the Northern cause, union and emancipation, that would forever remain the morally superior one. The Personal Memoirs is considered one of the greatest autobiographies in the English language, earning classic status both as literature and as history. When he died in July of 1885, he was by far the most famous of all Americans, both at home and abroad. More than a million people watched his funeral procession in New York City in August of that same year. This is Fifth Avenue that you see. The dedication of his massive tomb, which, which created a huge controversy because many cities wanted uh, Grant to be buried, uh, particularly Washington, D.C., and other cities are sort of vied for it. It was a gruesome competition, I must say. But um, New Yorkers always get their way in the end. And the dedication of his massive tomb in Manhattan on the 75th anniversary of his birth in 1897, drew another million plus people. Grant's tomb, which you see before you, the largest in North America, remained New York City's most popular tourist site until 1929. Hard to believe. Grant's beautiful memorial uh, sculpture in Washington, D.C., was dedicated on the 100th anniversary of his birth. Uh, these anniversaries are a big deal, aren't they? At the, uh, the, this memorial is at the foot of Capitol Hill, facing down the mall toward the Lincoln Memorial. The equestrian statue with flanking figures took 20 years to complete and is one of the, the second largest equestrian statue in the world. Yet today, tourists rarely visit historical sites devoted to Grant. Grant's Manhattan tomb was described by one critic as, quote, the least appreciated national monument in the country. His memoirs are unread, his monuments are unvisited, and others found in disrepair, and his reputation has become synonymous with brutal warfare and overwhelming corruption in public office. As important as Grant's legacy to the making of modern America, as important as appreciated as his military career would be, continue to be in the minds of many, by the 1920s, a constant drumbeat of criticism had already diminished his reputation. Grant, the savior of his country, had been supplanted in many people's mind by Grant the butcher, Grant the drunk, Grant the corrupt and competent president. How did this happen? How was this so? And now I'm going to turn to part two, and that is historical memory, Grant and historical memory. And I think it's important to keep in mind that, uh, that we, uh, the history books that we read are written by people who are influenced by their times and by what is important to them. And that's all I'm going to talk about here. Since the end of the war, ex-Confederates were busy writing books publishing newspaper articles, and giving many, many speeches. Their version of history consolidated itself very quickly into the phrase, the lost cause. 
The lost cause can be simply defined. The cause of the war was not slavery, but state rights. Southern armies were never defeated, but rather overwhelmed by numbers. And the Southern soldier was brave and true, better fighter than the Union soldier. Echo, and they echoed the perfection of the patron saint of the lost cause, Robert E. Lee. And that's, uh, there are many representations, both then and now, uh, pairing Grant and Lee together in, in, for the two men, what would be an uncomfortable proximity. But there you go. It doesn't matter. You can do anything you want. White Southerners thought of themselves as wronged people. They managed to transform their defeat into a proud and defiant, defiant sense of their regional specialness and unique identity. And I, personally, that was the point of the war, to bring the, the ex-Confederates back into the Union. That's fine. And, and it was necessary for them to tell stories about this uh, experience for them. It was so profoundly important. You only have to travel around in the South and see all the monuments and the graveyards to know that. But it was not enough to idolize their cause or Robert E. Lee. U.S. Grant's reputation and the meaning of his cause, the Union cause, the preservation of the Republic, and after 1863 emancipation had to be destroyed or brought down a notch or two. One book that began this trend was by the Southern journalist and ex-Confederate uh, veteran Edward A. Pollard. The book came out in 1866 and was titled, I think, very accurately, The Lost Cause. That's, wh that's where that phrase came from. The Union, uh, the Union General Pollard wrote in his introduction, quote, was one of the most remarkable accidents of the war. A man without any marked ability, certainly without genius, without fortune, without influence. And, and of course, people would compare him with Lee, who had all of those things, uh, certainly uh, seeming uh, from the time he was born. To lost cause historians whose influence, by the way, extended well beyond uh, southern boundaries, really affecting uh, uh, academic not only popular culture and movies like Birth of a Nation, Gone with the Wind, but also many academic historians as well. Uh, it's it's uh, a fascinating story to, to or a research project to trace this influence, which I did. I read uh, endless boring textbooks just so I could stand up here and, and talk about it with some authority. But Grant was the enemy because he defeated Robert E. Lee and thus Confederate hopes for independence. If they could not defeat Grant on the battlefield, at least they were going to tear him down in print, and that's exactly what they do. He was stupid. He had inferior military school uh, skills. Anybody could have won this war because all, of all the men and the materials the North had. One of my very favorite quotes about Grant, comparing Grant and Lee, comes from Jubal A. Early, who was a Confederate lieutenant general and a leading lost cause uh, partisan who gave many, many speeches and wrote articles. He summed up the attitude toward Grant. Quote, shall I compare Lee to his successful antagonist? As well compare the great pyramid which rears its majestic portions in the valley of the Nile to a pygmy perched on North Atlas. Well, we know which one is which. I do not have the time, and you do not want to waste your life listening to the details of all the specific charges of the pro-Southern writers and speakers who were so influential overall in redirecting attention from Union victory to glorifying Confederate defeat. Some were journalists, some were important military figures, uh, and all repeatedly attacked Grant's military record battle by battle. Grant's generalship, they claimed, was a fraud. His triumphs in the West were lucky, the result of happy fate or the incompetence of the Confederates in the Western theater, which was Mississippi and Tennessee, where Grant achieved his great victories in the first part of the war. Although in reality, Grant's Western victories were, uh, were actually 
low in terms of casualties. It was Shiloh that was singled out as a harbinger of Grant's willingness to sacrifice his men, something that was really uh, emphasized in the Overland Campaign of which uh, took place 150 years ago, almost 150 years ago, and then of, and then of course uh, uh, Sherman's March as well. Some of these explanations uh, for, for Grant's incompetence depends on controversial calculations of comparative sizes and losses of rival armies. But the point that I want to make is that Grant's reputation was harmed. As he lay dying in the years of his life, he was very much aware of this uh, attack on his reputation, and he answered it in his memoirs, and he was concerned that people wouldn't know about this. That's why he wrote his memoirs about the Union cause, about, uh, about the, uh, the challenge that he faced. But uh, the, this uh, type of attitude toward Grant continued into the 20th century. Uh, one of my uh, projects, I told you I've sat and read many history books from the 1910s and the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and I happened to pick up, I, I had uh, seen a citation somewhere quoting Winston Churchill on the Civil War. And I didn't know that this, this man who seemed to be so dazzling and saving England and everything had time to write history, but he did. He wrote a history of the English-speaking peoples. One of the volumes uh, uh, talked about America and the American Civil War. And this is what Churchill said of Grant. He said Grant, he wrote of Grant's quote-unquote unflinching butchery. And Winston Churchill argued that more is expected of the high command and then determination in thrusting men to their doom, and concluding that Grant's generalship, when compared to the incomparable Lee, quote, must be regarded as the negation of generalship. Churchill was neither the first nor the last historian to be perversely unaware that Grant lost proportionately more men than, uh, than that Lee lost proportionately more men than Grant in the Overland Campaign of 1864, which pitted the top generals against each other. But that's, that is, um, uh, again, to make my general point, in the 20th century, as Churchill's comments underscore, understanding or appreciation of the Union cause steadily declined against the, part the, the mythic and appealing romanticism of uh, white Southern uh, nobility. It seems that today, of all the memory traditions of the Civil War, I know you, you've heard some, uh, some talk about this before, the Union cause, the Lost cause, the Emancipationist cause, and reconciliation, the one uh, memory tradition that was strongest in the late 19th century, the Union cause, has been almost erased. Why, so why would so many people sacrifice so much that the United States could remain whole? In contrast, the warfare conducted by U.S. Grant, butchered, drunk, and above all, lucky, is repellent because it's modern warfare. Much of Grant's military reputation has boiled down to his ability to command overwhelming numbers. In other words, the more men you have in your army, the less the soldier. That can't be true, can it? Because the United States always had more men and more, and more materials than the Confederacy, but it didn't matter un until 1864. The top Union generals, the five commanders of the Army of the Potomac, the principal military arm in the East, all important Eastern theater, couldn't get the job done. People often fail to understand that Grant's commanding a large army and directing several large armies uh, could have been a great test. Is it not something to direct a force of nearly a million men? It was at this time that another general who was directing a large force uh, read some of Grant's memoirs. And, and he, uh, he said this for the record. In 1944, Dwight D. Eisenhower said, Grant devised a strategy to end the war. He alone had the determination, foresight, and wisdom to do it. 
and again, I'll make this point, in his memoirs, Grant showed that most importantly, it really mattered to him that future Americans sh could be confused or would forget about or downplay the hardships of the Union Army and the accomplishment of winning the war and preserving the Union and bringing freedom to all sections. And he, w and he, he really uh, was concerned about that. Grant became president, and the historians of the lost cause had their say about that as well. Grant didn't want to be president. He wasn't interested in, uh, in, in the nitty-gritty of politics. This is his campaign poster from 1868. Uh, he liked, disliked everything about it. He wanted to end out his days as, uh, as in his military career. And why did he become president? He became president because he was worried that uh, from, from the perspective of the general who helped win the war, that Andrew Johnson, who su succeeded uh, President Lincoln, was losing the war in peacetime. He, the, the goals of the war seemed to be in danger, and he agreed to uh, accept the unanimous verdict for him at the Republican Convention in 1868. Still, he explained to his close friends that, quote, he had been forced into accepting the nomination in spite of myself. And again, he, he, he just, he kept saying again and again to people, uh, William Sherman thought he was absolutely crazy to involve himself in politics, and he kept begging him not to do it. And he said, he said that he, he couldn't, he had to do it because he was afraid that he, that the sacrifice would be lost to, as he called them, mere trading politicians. And here is, here is the thing that, uh, to know that Grant, like Lincoln, wanted reconciliation with white Southerners, and he tried to do uh, what he thought was uh, everything that he could to make that a reality, but on the other hand, he had to do justice to, to the promise of a new life of free labor for African Americans. And he was, so he was a symbol of reconciliation at Appomattox, but also the general who became president and an architect of the first civil rights revolution. I don't think he expected to do that. In any case, Grant was proud of the fact that he was not a professional politician, Professional politicians are not very popular in our history, necessarily. They're certainly not popular today. And, and so uh, Americans uh, liked that about him. He didn't have much political experience, but he had the warm support of a majority of, of citizens. If Grant had only served one term, perhaps the successes of his administration would be celebrated rather than scorned. The first term of a two-term president generally is more positive. Grant supported laws upholding civil rights. He strongly supported the passage of the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the right to vote to black Americans. I've talked about that earlier, or referred to it earlier. He might, he might have been celebrated in the history books for his generous amnesty to former Confederates, an act that, that he signed off on and promoted in 1872 for his reform program for Native Americans, presiding over, at least in his first term, an amazingly surging economy, reaching, uh, promising to reach levels of productivity un, uh, unexperienced in the world before then, for his peaceful settlement of grievances with England that occurred during the war, the so-called solving of the Alabama claims controversy through arbitration. He, um, and, and he might have uh, continued that. In 1872, he was re-elected with a much larger majority. The Republicans <laughs> must have liked what he, liked what he was doing because they, his, I think his vote, uh, votes increased by at least 600,000. This is this, the uh, 1872 campaign poster. I love that. Uh, they're in their working class clothes, which uh, they both didn't have, the Vice President Henry Wilson, they both, it's not clear if they ever wore them, but their fathers did, I guess, at some point. But it appeals to free labor, it appeals to working people, they liked it. In 1872, you, you really don't want to run for a second term, do you? It all comes tumbling down in the second term, and for Grant, it certainly did. 
uh, he um, a scandal such as the whiskey ring, and I'm giving this as a, a cartoon that mocks the corruption in the Grant administration that sort of burst upon the scene from 1872, 1873, and 1874 in particular, uh, the, all the rings, the whiskey ring, all the nefarious activities that he was charged with. Then a major depression occurred in 1873 uh, that obliterated the northern public's desire to continue unpopular reconstruction policy. It was a frustrating time for him. He was attacked throughout the country and uh, this is a, an example of a mocking cartoon of uh, how Grant has actually come to be remembered in the history books as this untutored, innocent general. You might think uh, Henry Adams uh, said of him uh, that, that, um, that he was a great general, can be a baby president. And th that's kind of the attitude that a lot of people had in those days. Uh, it certainly was um, uh, uh, Reconstruction, the Grant Civil War and Reconstruction are meshed together. His, the people who wrote the history books and who were imbued with the lost cause had great effect in, on academic historians writing throughout most of the 20th century about the disaster of Reconstruction and how Grant uh, presided over. Reconstruction is, is a very complex thing. I mentioned this uh, uh, earlier today that my students are exhausted when I teach Civil War at UCLA with Appomattox. They, they, they say, enough, we don't want to study Reconstruction. But you can't understand the Civil War unless you learn about Reconstruction. Uh, and I, I, always, I, I also give this quote, William Dean Howells, a 19th century uh, American novelist, said, what the American public always wants is a tragedy with a happy ending. And I think that's true. In our own time, the history books right now, for the most part, reflect a completely positive portrait of Reconstruction. It's just been completely turned upside down. It's very interesting. The generation of historians who were influenced and inspired by the second civil rights revolution, taking place in Atlanta in part, uh, rejected the racist version of Reconstruction, which, uh, and now uh, the, the, the memory tradition that is most represented, certainly in our national uh, commemoration of the 150th, is the story of emancipation, the story of freedom, putting African Americans in the center of the history, and, and uh, that has really changed the way that, that we look at Reconstruction. Absolutely. But one part of the story remains the same. Grant's presidential uh, reputation has not uh, uh, elevated very much. And I think that uh, that is reflected in his low presidential rankings, that uh, presidential rankings I, first, uh, I think first were done, the official one was done in 1949, and they have regular and uh, regularly been published ever since, taking uh, scholars, political science historians, who's the best ranking the best presidents. Uh, a couple of them had Grant below James Buchanan, which couldn't be any worse, any worse news. But he's, in any case, his low presidential rankings throughout the 20th century are, are very much in uh, the way that people in popular culture think of, uh, of, of Grant. Uh, they, uh, it especially comes out with, uh, with the idea that he was always drunk. And uh, I, again, I have done diligent research in this. I have uh, I've read all the documents about Grant's supposed drunken episodes. I've read all the scholars who've looked, uh, looked through the evidence. And the definitive last word that I can find on Grant's drinking has, is that he had a binge or two during the war, but the exhaustive evidence shows that Grant rarely imbibed and never when it counted. I think we have to be mature when we're judging our presidents or important figures in history. They're flawed people. Oh, are they flawed? And we, we have to understand that and look, t and look at the, the bad along with the accomplishment. And I always get, I always get the, the question, was Grant a drunk? And, 
and I, my response is, do you think Abraham Lincoln would, would have, have put a drunk in charge of, now don't say yes, uh, in the army. I mean, it just, it just is, I, I mean, it's really something, it's really extraordinary to think that you would have a, a, a complete lunatic alcoholic who, uh, staggering around on the battlefield and as president, it just, it, it didn't happen. But the stereotype is perpetuated endlessly in popular culture. And I've, and, and I, I have, um, again, I've done a lot of research watching uh, old television programs, like the Beverly Hillbillies, had, had, do you remember that show? Does anyone remember that show? Anyway, they have, uh, it, it's actually pretty funny, but they had, th there was an episode where they portrayed a drunken Grant running around like a loony bin, and, and then there's another, a more recent show, The Family Guy, which presented this bizarre reenactment of, of Appomattox. Where, where Grant uh, is, is drinking from a bottle of whiskey. It was his favorite drink, by the way. And he's shouting insults at General Lee at Appomattox. After a struggle, Confederate victory is declared, at which point a member of the crowd stood up to defend the Northern general that dr and saying, that drunken idiot kicked your sorry asses. I don't know how many people who watch The Family Guy, this animated series, would even know who Grant is uh, or Lee. But there you go. It's, it's just pervasive. It's pervasive in the, the culture and the movies from uh, even up to today, which I find interesting. And, and uh, it's the same for movies. Grant is usually, I mean, he's almost never portrayed in the movie, even though his life would make a great movie. Uh, I watched Steven Spielberg's Lincoln with great interest. I enjoyed the movie very much. Uh, waiting for Grant, because I know that Grant and Lincoln were in constant contact during this time and consulted each other and Grant visited. Well, I must have uh, uh, blinked my eyes because there was Grant on the screen, but it was for fewer than 30 seconds. And um, that was the, the sum of it. But it wasn't about Grant, it was about Lincoln. In, in any case, the, uh, the depiction that I've sketched out for you is, is one that... Um, is one that has had a remarkable resilience throughout the, the generations. And I think that it's not sustainable anymore. And I would, uh, I would tell you that by the 1990s, his reputation had begun to change on the basis of, uh, for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is that for the first time out of a project that was funded by the federal government, the NEH, bless them, uh, per, uh, gathered all of the scattered grant collections in, uh, throughout the country and published them in 31 big volumes called the Papers of U.S. Grant. They're just indispensable now, but they, they provide quite a different record of the man for scholars to, to look at. And the, the, what's emerging is a body of books where the negative interpretations no longer square with the evidence, with the, with the, the new information emergency, emerging. I don't know if it's going to make a huge difference, uh, but it, it already has made an impact on our field. And that is what I want to address in the last part of my talk, part three. And I want to just tell you something that, I, that has come to me in my, and I'm going to take this ridiculous picture off. And, and put, this is a very famous sculpture uh, that was ubiquitous. People had it in their they, uh, expensive uh, sculptures and cheap ones, but it, it was called The Council of War by uh, John Rogers, and it depicted the three great uh, northern leaders at the, in the last days of the war discussing uh, the, uh, the issues of surrender and the issues of reconstruction. Edwin Stanton is the other one. Uh, he had the greatest beard at the, that time. But I, 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 it really bothers me, I, t I tell my students about this all the time, that you have to go beyond the stereotypes. You just have to. And Grant's historical reputation has not risen above a stereotype. And the definition of a stereotype is, quote, a widely held 
but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. And a stereotype can be exaggerating the good qualities or exaggerating the hor horrible qualities, but whatever it is, it should not be accepted on face value. You should go a little bit further and find out for yourself. And, and that's what I'm going to try and, and sort of put all this new scholarship together, including my book, and, and what, what is a better way to look at Grant. And I look at him at the sesquicentennial, a time for revision, as a soldier statesman. And that means a soldier statement, statesman, that, that linking of that means that I think that we have to stop separating the general from the president, just like we cannot separate the Civil War from Reconstruction. Too often the careers of a military leader who also has a political career, and again one thinks of Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th president, but we think of them as separal, separate and unequal, a great general but a baby politician kind of thing. A better way of looking at Grant is not to s slice and dice neatly his military and political career, but to approach it as an integrated experience, to emphasize the continuities in his life as a general and a president, a soldier statesman. The so the question should be this. How can we assess the overall development of Grant's judgment and powers of leadership under extreme pressure during the war in terms of how he used that experience to approach the political side of his career from 1865 to 1876? If we can answer that question, address that question, or at least investigate it, I would contend that the stereotypical image of Grant could be replaced by a richer, more complicated portrait, one in which he emerges as what we can call an essential president, who should go down in history as one of the most important champions of civil rights and a president who kept the Union together during the Reconstruction crisis, because it was a crisis. It was full of violence and drama that you couldn't even make up. And somehow, at the end, the country stuck together. We know from looking at the civil wars in history and at the present time, it's mighty hard to do. And maybe we can appreciate it more if we understand the global perspective. And I want to tell you um, how we can look at, just briefly, his experience during the war uh, as a top general. This is a very famous painting, oddly entitled The Peacemakers. Uh, when the, uh, uh, Lincoln and David Porter and Grant and Sherman met at the end of the war. The artist was a friend, George Healy, was a friend of Sherman's and, and uh, caught him in his characteristic pose of telling people what to do. I don't know if that really happened during the, uh, the meeting. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any notes on that one. But I want to say that in, in the war, throughout the war, throughout Grant's war career, he believed that the Union was going to be preserved, and that is what guided and sustained his military policy. In, uh, he developed what we can call a broad national perspective. I mean, all the West Point guys had that. They, they were sophisticated and cosmopolitan for their day. They had traveled all over the United States already, but he believed he had that broad national perspective on the means as well as the end of the rebellion. As a general, he not only planned and executed military campaigns, but he also presided over the occupation of the southern population and territory. He formulated and implemented policies and practices that not only predicted Reconstruction, but actually was Reconstruction. It was just as much Reconstruction that the Union Army was conducting and Grant was conducting as Lincoln's Reconstruction, his famous 10% plan. In fact, Lincoln's plan was based on the experiences of Grant and other generals. And that experience certainly helped him prepare him for the office of the president. You, uh, you also have to uh, consider that his career after the war, after the war ended, after Lincoln's assassination, a very dangerous time for this country. Lincoln's assassination necessarily changed the dynamic tremendously uh, in the North. There were many people in the North now who wanted to punish the South, 
with treason trials and all, there, there's just all kinds of things going on. And Grant, in those years, had to become invested in the political process in order to save the union that was won in the war from being lost in the peace. I'm making that point again and again. He directed the military policy in the post-war uh, South for Andrew Johnson, making decisions and taking actions that brought him directly into the unfolding political crisis with the Johnson administration. Grant's political position was solidified, interestingly, most people don't know that he served as Secretary of War for eight months in the Johnson administration. And uh, he was at the center of power there, too. Handling the post of the Secretary of War proved vitally important to Grant's political education and maturation. During this time, he enacted and guided political policies designed to cement and advance wartime goals. Grant was demonstrating to the country his understanding of the issues of the Civil War and how those issues would continue to impact the public policy of the country for years to come. And so that we, we see that there's an overlap, a temporal overlap, between the Civil War experience, the immediate post-war experience, and his taking up of the presidency. Except for, and historians are saying this, this is what uh, the people who are presently revising or changing, we always, just like historians revise the story of Reconstruction, they're now revising Grant. Except for Lincoln and FDR, Grant shouldered more grave responsibilities than any other chief executive in our history, dealing with a massively complicated job of reconstructing the nation, bringing the southern states back to the family table, the national family table, bringing them back to their rightful place, but also setting a new place for the freed men and women. It was a very, very difficult time. And that is just a, a part of his presidency. He also had the economic depression to deal with and many, many other things. But more and more of the revisionist building on the work of the academic scholarship that re has reshaped modern understanding of Reconstruction recognized that Grant operated amidst, uh, amid intensely racist forces and in both the North and South that made it very hard to, com to complete those goals. Uh, of, the, of the war, especially when it had to do with uh, civil rights for African Americans in the South, and especially voting. Northern white people, by the 1874, considered the main goal of the war, saving the Union, much more important than equality for Southern blacks. Northern whites had come to feel that the constant political and military interference in Southern elections wasn't worth the price. It wasn't worth the turmoil. Most Northern whites felt uh, against Grant that, uh, that it wasn't, and against the Republican Party, that, that uh, Southern whites had accepted Appomattox. They accepted defeat. They were getting on with their lives. And African Americans had freedom and free labor. And if they, if they didn't want to vote, I mean, if voting was such a big deal, to the ex-Confederates, forget about it. Don't, it, it wasn't, I mean, the, I'm putting this in a very harsh way, but that's the way they felt. And, and it was called, a growing movement was called Home Rule for the South, and this originated among a uh, wing of the Republican Party, and Northern Democrats had always wanted it. But uh, when we as historians look at it, we find that Grant's campaign against breaking the Ku Klux Klan in 1872 uh, that, and other parts of his record that Grant demonstrated far more commitment to African Americans than his people in the North were willing to give. And a president can't go further than the people want. The, the, Congre the Democrats returned to a majority in the House of Representatives in the election of 1874, and there's nothing uh, that, not much that Grant could do. Uh, but Grant himself is emerging in the new history books as a thoughtful, intelligent, engaged president, fully aware of his responsibilities, duties, and the difficulties inherent in the, in the role of chief executive. Grant's final task as president, hark back to his first, 
and perhaps most important achievement to ensure a stable nation, a stable transition, this time with the disputed election of 1876. We're going to, those of us who care about the Civil War and how it's being interpreted in the sesquicentennial, if you pay attention to the reviews, there's going to be a lot of books coming out on Grant, adding to the already scholarship books by, about Grant uh, by Walter Isaacson, for example, and Sean Valentz and Ronald White uh, in the next few years. And if these revisionists prove as resilient and determined as Grant, then and only then might there be a chance for Grant to resume his place among the most important and honored figures in American history. If justice as well as scholarship is served, Grant's presidential reputation will be higher. It's already rising in the most recent presidential ranking. He was, as I said before, an essential president. Grant's legacy to his own generation was deep and wide. My book argues that the t at the time of his death in 1885 at Mount McGregor, New York, Ulysses S. Grant was an icon in the historical memory of the war, shared by a whole generation of Americans at that time, men and women, whether they loved or hated him. They had an appreciation, or many of them had an appreciation of Grant. They believed, and, and this is this, I read uh, thousands of, of obituaries uh, after Grant died, and they showed this remarkable appreciation of Grant that, that put him as a soldier general. They thought that you could only undertake his true measure with the recognition that he was both the general that saved the Union and the stalwart president who made sure that it stayed together. For them, U.S. Grant was already an American hero and an American myth. Thank you. Whatever you say. Okay. Questions for Dr. Wall this evening. I, do you want me to uh, answer the questions? Dr. Wall, did Grant's General Order 11 ever come back to haunt him later on? Oh, yes. Let me, uh, the, it's an excellent question. Uh, General Order number 11 issued in early 1862, and it was a notorious order issued by Grant banning the Jews from the Western theater, essentially, that, that was under Grant's control, mostly in Tennessee and some in Kentucky. And it, it's, uh, it did come back to haunt him. You couldn't do that today and be president, could you, and be promoted? No. But, but, it, but again, it's something that, that just to talk about it is so shocking today. Well, it's reminiscent of what happened in Hitler's Germany, that Jews would be rounded up and, uh, and uh, prevented from doing their daily activities. It, it affected about 100 uh, Jewish people, but it, it had a much larger context, and it came, it came out of something that I, that I brought up. This was, uh, this was as Grant was preparing for the Vicksburg campaign. He, he wasn't only preparing, it was about to, one of the stages of the Vicksburg campaign was taking place. And, and I'm sorry, I said February 1862, but I meant December 1862 is when it came out. And he was extraordinarily busy, but Union generals uh, of the high rank of Grant were expected to do a whole bunch of other things, which he was doing. He had to, he had to uh, uh, deal with the problems of occupation. Southern civilians were not happy with the Union Army occupying their territory. There were all kinds of issues arising that. There were, but principally, the, the banning of the Jewish traders came out of a huge problem that was developing and an argument and a that was developing between the Lincoln administration and the military. The Lincoln administration wanted people to, the Southerners, to know that it was going to be easy to come back into the Union, that they could get their livelihood going again. They wanted the cotton trade to resume, and that was what this about, and what this was about. And it was very, it was 
corrupt. There were all kinds of things going on. For Grant, it got to a, uh, the point where, uh, where he believed, and many other, you can read this in many other Union generals, believed that cotton traders uh, were, th th the result of that trade was to strengthen the enemy. So you, you, have, you have the cotton flowing north, which, which is w the, the normal interruption. The, the, the country was knitted together uh, it, with, this, with an economic system that worked and profited both sections. Uh, and to get that going again and have a lot of illegal trading as well as legal trading going on uh, was a, a problem in that the, the funds that came from the illegal cotton trading, which was huge at this time, would go to make the Confederate Army stronger. And I mean, it, it's, it's a really interesting situation. Jefferson Davis had problem because his administration wanted to encourage the trading under the table. And in the midst of this, Grant's father, Jesse, who was a wily businessman and wanted to get, he lived in Kentucky, he wanted to get into the cotton trade, and I, I will bring the story to an end, appeared with his business partners uh, and asked a special favor of Grant, uh, who were Jewish, by the way, and, and, and Grant, uh, uh, using the example, there were other uh, generals who also banned Jewish traders. Anti-Semitism was the norm in the 19th century, and this is an example of it. Immediately, Grant knew he made a mistake. Immediately, Lincoln knew that he made a mistake. He rescinded the order uh, very quickly, and uh, it, there's a book, a really good book on G uh, uh, General Grant and the Jews, it's called, by Jonathan Sarna. Are you familiar with him? It was just published. I wrote a review of it. And, and Grant was mortified by this. He apologized many times to the Jewish community. He met with them uh, uh, at, in his presidency. He, his president, in his presidency, he did more uh, for, to bring the issues that concern Jews to the forefront than any other president before and, and many afterwards as well. And he was the first president to go to, Israel, to Palestine and made a huge point of it. This thing about uh, him being the butcher and all that, uh, there's an idea that I have, and that is that you know, he expended his troops to have the victory to get the war over quicker. For instance, like in uh, Afghanistan right now, it's carried on so long that a six-year-old, when it began, Yeah, it's, it's, I've heard that some six-year-olds are of military age in that area. It's a, it's a great question, very thoughtful, and, and it's it, an endlessly fascinating topic to those of us who study the Civil War, uh, to, to, to know how bloody it was and how, what a tragedy it was. The Civil War is a tragedy for any country. And the war was going on and on, and, and that is, this speaks to Lincoln's frustration uh, with his, the generals of the Army of the Potomac, General uh, McClellan and, and Ambrose Burnside and Joe Hooker and George Meade, they all, uh, they, they just, they didn't, f in, in Lincoln's view, they didn't fight to win, to end the war. They, they fought these uh, tremendous battles. Gettysburg was a great victory, but it was not secured in, on July uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, because Lee's army escaped. You, you may know the story that Lincoln despaired because he knew that the war would go on. If an army was extant, if an army was out in the field, then, then it was, the war was going to go on. And the Union had to do a lot more to secure their victory than the Confederates. The Confederates had to keep in the, f the field day after day. They had to continue their government day after day. They were a nation. They had all the things going for them. If they could wear down the will of the North, then they would emerge victorious as an independent nation. That's what they wanted.
And there were times in the war that the northern population was turning against it, turning against Lincoln and the war effort. And the longer it went on, the more likely that would be to happen. The higher the casualty rates. I mean, and, and that is something, uh, all these Union generals, they had these amazing battles. They're fascinating. Sometimes, uh, as with Antietam and Gettysburg, they defeated Robert E. Lee on the battlefield, or it was a tactical a draw, but a strategic victory, but the war went on, and they just couldn't finish the job. And that is, that is what Lincoln liked about Grant. Grant's, you, you may know that his great victory, the capture of the Citadel City uh, of, atop the Mississippi River, Vicksburg, was, uh, was his favorite. It was his favorite for many reasons, because it was the way he, what he liked about Grant is that Grant not only defeated the army, the, arm, the southern armies around that area in battles, but he also s accepted the surrender of a 30,000 uh, force that, uh, under John Pemberton. And, and that, that put an end, I mean really, the, for the most part, the Western theater was secured after Chattanooga. And, I mean, there were places where it weren't, wasn't for the United States. In any case, uh, it, it is true that the Civil War was bloody. I don't feel that butcher is a good thing to call the Civil War, gen not all, certainly not Grant and Lee, but they did, they were in it to win it. If you wanted to fight and die in the Civil War, you volunteered for the Army of Northern Virginia, had the highest casualty rates by far of any other. Robert E. Lee was a brilliant general, but he knew that in order to win, they would have to uh, require sacrifice, and they did on both sides. One incident in his life that raised him in my estimation was his, his threat to President Johnson to resign when President Johnson decided he wanted to prosecute Harvey Lee. Could you comment on that? Yes, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is a really interesting incident, and let me just repeat it. Uh, the, question uh, that he asked to, uh, me to comment on, and, and that is uh, uh, the terms at Appomattox that Grant wrote out uh, that uh, were so generous, the last sentence is, is really uh, th uh, went a little bit further than Lincoln wanted Grant to do, but he approved of it, but it was very generous, guaranteeing that as long as the Confederate soldiers lay down their arms and take an oath accept the, the power of the United States, there would be really essentially guaranteeing there would be no trials or prosecutions. And Grant, uh, uh, Grant believed, and Lincoln believed, that was the way. Lincoln said at that meeting, he said, he said to Grant, he said, let them up easy, the Southern, a hard war but a soft peace, that's what we want. And, and the, the, um, uh, that was the understanding that Grant had. Lincoln's, as I said, Lincoln's assassination, you might imagine, I mean, what, what a dramatic time to live through. Uh, uh, we, we often whine about all the things that are going on, and they are upsetting, but you fight this massive civil war, great areas of the country are destroyed, thousands, uh, 750,000 men died, uh, just, just a tremendous upheaval. The war is finally over, and the president is assassinated, and the president of the winning side is assassinated. Th th there was lots of, of talk about treason trials at that time uh, <clears throat> on the part of Northerners who were very angry. And Andrew Johnson, before he turned the other way, announced in a cabinet meeting that, uh, that uh, he agreed with, uh, I think it was Edwin Stanton, who suggested that we start arresting wanted to arrest Jefferson Davis, put him on trial, wanted, and, and, and Robert E. Lee. And Grant shifted in his seat, and he said, well, he said, if you do that, Mr. President, I'm resigning for, uh, as, uh, in, as part of your leadership team as general of the, I'm, I'm resigning. I, th th that doesn't, that, that is a dishonorable thing, and I won't have anything to do with it. And Johnson immediately dropped the idea, in fact, uh, the, the only Confederate, th there was a trial for Henry Wirtz, Wirtz of Andersonville. There were some other trials of much lesser known 
officers that resulted in executions for war crimes, but nothing like on the, on the scale that was uh, envisioned by a few people. And Robert E. Lee was never arrested, and Grant prevented that. He also interceded in other, uh, other um, impending arrests after the Lincoln and, and of top Confederate generals. The uh, Jefferson Davis uh, was, <laughs> he was the one, he, once he was let out of jail uh, at Fort Monroe, I guess he spent about two years, he was jailed, uh, <clears throat> and after he uh, was arrested when he fled Richmond uh, for Georgia, right? Irwindale, is that, is that the where? And, uh, and dressed in women's clothes. You, you wouldn't believe I've read through countless uh, soldiers' letters, northern soldiers' letters, uh, as well as southern. You don't find this in the, the Confederate soldiers' letters, but th they all, the, the ones who made it to the end of the war, all have this carte de vist of, uh, or, or some kind of ridiculous drawing of Jefferson Davis in elaborate women's clothes and uh, being arrested was. It's always funny for a man to be dressed in a woman's clothes, I guess. Um, but, uh, but Jefferson Davis was actually itching for a trial. And he had, he had hired a New York lawyer, a fancy New York Democratic lawyer, who was going to argue that secession was legal. And it, the trial would have to be held in the South. So uh, that, that trial never happened. The United States decided not to bring charges against him. Interesting. What inspired your interest in Grant? As a child? I mean, where did you get No, it? not as a child. As a child, I read Gone with the Wind and, and <laughs> Little House on the Prairie. And uh, it is a good read. Uh, it's all good. It's all good. And I, I was always fascinated with 19th century history, but it wasn't until I was hired by UCLA to teach the upper division lecture course in the Civil War, which hadn't been taught on a regular basis for about 25 years. And I wanted to make it my own, and I, I, I embarked on a intensive study for my lectures uh, on the military side, because I knew everything about the Civil War except the military side, <laughs> which you could, argue, you could say, you could make an argument that that was the most important thing because that's what everyone was focused on. So I knew a lot about women nurses and, and the home front and everything, but not, I wanted to integrate military history, and I kept coming up against this Grant guy, and it just fascinated me how, uh, how he, uh, would, I, I didn't really put it all together, I didn't realize how, how he dominated this time period uh, until I started reading more and more about him. And I, I became interested in an historical memory be, uh, out of that. Can you tell us just a word about his relationship with his wife? And well, br do you know Bruce Catton? Not, not personally, he's dead now. <laughs> That was a weird question. The, the question is, uh, can I tell you about his relationship with his wife, Julia, Julia Dent Grant, who was a, from a southern slaveholding family. Her father called himself Colonel Dent. They lived in Missouri. And um, he met her when he had just graduated from West Point and fell in love with her. And I, I, I think she was smart and interesting she was not beautiful. She had one eye going uh, inward, and, and she was, uh, but she was very vivacious, and they, they fell in love. He went off to the Mexican War, was very frustrated that she wouldn't marry him right away, but her, her father had to be brought along because her father, uh, uh, Colonel Dent, was upset that the Grant family, and particularly Jesse Grant, Grant's father, uh, was, a, uh, was an abolitionist in his mind. Uh, so th things had to be worked out, but they, uh, they had one of the, uh, and I said Bruce Catton, who is a fantastic Civil War historian, who wrote, I think, st still today, the best two-volume biography of Grant's military career. Uh, Grant moves south and Grant takes command, and he said, uh, Ulysses and Julia had the happiest marriage in the 19th century. <laughs> I don't know how he knew 
but I always remember that. And they, and they did, they really were devoted to each other. And she was, uh, despite all evidence, when he was young uh, or younger, he, he wasn't a huge success, but she would tell friends, he's going to be president of the United States. And they would snicker behind her back and whatever. But that's, that's, uh, they were very supportive of each other. They had four children. They were a, a really, uh, loving family. The, the White House, the, the social part of their White House, she was a great first lady, brought a lot of uh, needed changes from Mary Lincoln, and, uh, uh, and uh, they, they had the wedding of the century, at least so far, in the White House when their daughter married an English aristocrat. Uh, and she, she had an unhappy marriage. She had maybe one of the unhappiest marriage in the 19th century. And, and, and by the time she came to be with her father when he died, she and her husband were getting a divorce. Anyway, I don't know why I said that. They had a very happy marriage. And, <laughs> and that's, not, that's a nice thing, I think. Someone over here. I appreciate your comments about Grant uh, being constrained by the American public. He can only go so far in pushing for, for black rights. But could he have done more, or should he have done more, to react to the violence in the South against the freedmen? Because that's, that's another issue. That's, uh... Could he have done more to react against the, the South? It's, uh, here's something interesting. There, there, from the very beginning, the, it was hard enough, and we can appreciate how hard it was for uh, the defeated white population of the Confederacy to lose four billion dollars in their capital in, in the form of, of human beings, but that was still a part of the foundation of the prosperity, but also the foundation of the whole social system. And it wasn't only the slaveholders, it involved every white person living in the South. It was bound to be problematical. And yet, uh, and yet the Northerners were, uh, and the Northern government were utterly unprepared for the, the level of violence that started in 1865 and 1866 that was perpetrated against African Americans. And this is what brought radical republicanism, and maybe that's, I mean, I, I think that a lot of radical republicans were vindictive. This is, but this is what brought them to power under Andrew Johnson, the outrage that many Northerners who were not did not believe in racial equality, but still they, they believed in freedom for African Americans and free labor, and they wanted the, the freed people to at least be safe in their persons. And that was not happening in cities like uh, uh, Baton Rouge and, and uh, particularly Memphis, but uh, other places where whites attacked blacks in their neighborhoods, and that was shocking. But by 1868, it seemed that things had settled down once Johnson was saved from impeachment and then Grant came to president. And I, I, don't, I, I just don't think that they realized the power of the, of the anger, the, the symbolic nature of a black man voting. We don't think of voting, obviously we don't think much of voting today because we don't vote in, in the great numbers. In the 19th century, voting was a symbol of, of manhood, was a symbol of uh, something that was very powerful and very important. And to give that to African Americans, well, Republicans found it, I mean, I, I think that, that he could have done more. Do you know what he did? He did a lot. He took a lot of heat for his actions. He, he didn't want to do it in every state all the time because um, that would essentially bring the whole South under military occupation. They, there wasn't a big army left anymore. He couldn't do it every time, but he, he tried the Republican Party, all the Republican governments in the South, and this is why Reconstruction is so mind-blowingly hard to understand. Every, it was different. Every state was different. Every county in every state had a, a different experience. African Americans <coughs> thrived in some states where they were a majority for a while. This was a huge biracial experiment. Never had anything been attempted like this. And I just, I just don't think they, I just don't think uh, p people knew what to do. Uh, but he, but they tried, and Republican governors tried, and uh, African Americans, some of which served as government, many in the legislature, African Americans voted in great numbers. They were 
they, they really took their citizenship seriously. But for various reasons, uh, some of which uh, had to do with the corruption in the Republican governments themselves and the, the desire of Repub the Republican leadership to try and get more white people into it, the whole coalition fell apart. And th the interesting thing is that the, the, uh, there was a compromise about free labor. It's called sharecropping. It didn't benefit anybody. Most of the poor was South, uh, most of the South was poor at this time, having lost much of their wealth. It would take a long, long time to recover it, wouldn't it? Uh, it's, um, and Atlanta is the exemplar of that. The, the, it's, the, it's the New South City. It's a city of Henry Grady, a, a completely uh, different hi uh, history than maybe some of the other uh, devastated parts. Well, thank you very much.